Hello, I'm Nadia Heron, General Manager of AQ Biosim here at Sandbox AQ. It's an exciting time to be here today, and I'm sitting down with Michael Dolston, Chief Scientific Officer at Pfizer. Michael, you've had a long and exciting career, and AI has increasingly become a critical tool in biomedicine. I would love for you to give us a little bit about your background and from your extensive experience in the industry, how have you seen AI change the way we approach these processes? When you think about the field, what excites you the most about the current developments? Perhaps reflect on where you've seen the biggest impacts at Pfizer, for example. Nadia, thank you so much for invitation to this um, intriguing, inspiring dialogue. and. Uh, I think uh, just the two of you us having this conversation where you represent, I think, the movement of mathematical disciplines um, and Jack from Sandbox AQ coming from the success of Silicon Valley and, and converging with enthusiasm ideas to um, the biomedical community of scientists which I have served for the benefit of patients for decades, and meeting here in a virtual great conversation, exemplify that this is a time point where we can expect the biggest change to occur in decades in biomedicine. We always have believed in multidisciplinary interaction is where you see the real spark of innovation. Over the last number of years, mathematics has been coming as such a strong force, and now with the terminology of providing algorithms under the umbrella name of artificial intelligence, that I think opens a window, a very wide window of fresh air into biomedicine. I've always believed that this interdisciplinary space that many years ago as I worked in early drug discovery where our destination was shaped by the sharpest minds of medicinal chemists or protein designers for small or large molecules or possibly vaccine designers and our long training ground was the, the thing that could uh, create the, the, the key to the lock for us. And we tried to do things not one by one, but we used quantitative structure activity, optimizing multiple properties at the same time. Now, all of that which was helpful was occurring at the pace usually of months and years in programs. And the new powerful algorithms, algorithms provided now with the strengths of supercomputing allow mathematics really to provide a turbocharge to biomedicine. I believe we should have an open mindset that in the same way as human medicine went from being organ cells, tissues in textbooks that were big things like in the bookshelf behind me, I use, if you look in the background, a lot of medical textbooks to remind me how conservative medicine and pharmaceutical R&D, and that we need to look upon them almost like the dictionaries of the past and be able to um, move along into a more mathematical, quantitative way of looking at biomedicine. In the same way, I think we need to have some thoughtful and cautious optimism when it comes to where can we deploy AI with immediate impact. My first message is, uh, this new revolution of AI is going to play an impact on the entire spectrum. Yes, I know some of you are listening and feeling that this is over optimist but let me tell you, it's just a matter of time. So I'm also a cautious optimist saying that some of the early biology, we need to generate much more data before we can use some of the powerful AI models to get answers to the questions that we may not even have raised. But as we move to areas that are much more heavily populated with data, like designing molecules, already today we at Pfizer and I know peers at other companies are able to accelerate 
how you can design small molecules, whether it's antivirals and our properties in vivo, like we did actually with Paxlovid, that many of you unfortunately probably are using because of the surge in COVID, to crafting new RNA vaccines or looking at the sequence of amino acids encoded in um, antibodies. All of those are at prime time to explore large data set and predict properties that would take much, much longer and not be able to be as refined than what we start to see that AI can do. But it's a marriage of AI and HI, artificial and human intelligence coming together. And this journey continues through clinical development where we still have optimists but need to have respect that some data sets are not large enough or not diverse enough, that AI becomes more a learning tool. And as we get the drug into post-approval and have maybe millions of observations in a treated population, we can sort through that whether we use initial natural language processing or more sophisticated machine learning algorithms to extract information and quickly get the profile of the drug that starts to be part of the reality, and months by months and year by year, it becomes mainstream. So my message is, it's not where AI will play an impact, it's different time point when it's mature for different phases. So my advice to the many scientists that I know are curious about this, bring this thoughtful approach of unbiased, exploring, verify and validate, but with optimism with you. And for those that are fearful, it's always better to be part of those finding out the path to the forward than end up being left behind. Fearful doesn't mean that you can't be skeptical in a very logical way, but join the new community of AI, HI teams that meets the digital computational discipline intersecting with biomedicine, join it and play a very important moderating role rather than standing by the wayside. Wonderful. Thank you for those reflections, Michael. Those are wonderful examples with Paxlovid and others and, and how AI can have a role also in the clinical trial domain uh, when the time is right. When, when you think about the AI landscape, large language models have gained much attention. Moving to this quantitative mindset you mentioned, now there's a growing focus on large quantitative models, which are equation-based, grounded in physics and chemistry, and generate data for AI models to be trained on. Can you reflect why this is such an important shift for biopharma and what new possibilities these models might open up? Well, what I learned from dialogues with you and Yakidara at Sandbox AQ that, that comes from this kind of Silicon Valley community that have uh, laid the foundation of both LLMs and these quantity models is that on one hand, let's celebrate how powerful the LLMs are in structure information. And uh, I, I think it's so intriguing how you can see this LLM AI scientists, as we may call them, which on one hand can be just using the, the type of trained open AI-like systems to answer questions rapidly, your proprietary version where you have used your own data sets to train it further. And as you indicated, it allows us to do operational things faster and in a way replace a lot of the human error where do we write clinical protocols, regulatory submission, safety reports, the ability to merge uh, the unbiased, objective way of a well-trained LLM to summarize things with a fresh human intelligence moderation is so powerful. But it's a lot about taking what we anyway would have been able to perform much faster. And that's, of course, tremendously important. We only have that much resources to plan for clinical studies, and now we may be able to do two, three in a shorter time point than what we had resources to do one. But your questions move me back into uh, areas that are more 
quantitative. And I do think it started with uh, predicting how proteins could fold, and we can simulate, I think, different type of changes in those proteins so fast and so powerful to open up new insights that may relate to a confirmational change in proteins. And by being able to run lots and lots of those simulations, we can cluster findings into different types of uh, outcomes. And each of them can then be probed for their importance in a biological system. Once you have decided for how a protein may take a certain position during an active cellular uh, process or interact with a key second protein, now comes the, pro the, the next step in designing maybe small molecules or antibodies that intervene. And I'm amazed how we now are able with these large quantity models not just to do take the mass of data we have in how a certain lead series should be optimized in order to maximize energies in the various binding interaction, whether polar or hydrophobic. But I have and we have started to see that you can generate new compound structures that we didn't actually think that were constrained by the experience of the human mind uh, in this space. And that's so fascinating that we are open up a broader chemical space based on quantitative uh, large models. So what I like here is that it's not just about doing things faster. Yes, that's an important part, providing multiple layer optimization at the same time. There are so many aspects on the journey from a perfect molecule, a drug, to a perfect medicines for patients. And I think we can better than ever use these quantity models to build in closer to perfection. But what really I think uh, is the chapter taking momentum now is to open new chemical space, find molecular structure, loops in antibodies, RNA sequences, that doesn't represent uh, nature made, nature invented. We spoke about AI, HI, and NI. NI represent nature invented over a long term of evolution. Now I think it's possible to do a synthetic invented based on the large quantity models. And I find that fascinating that it moves drug design almost into a new space. It's like humans that travel to the moon are now aiming for new planets. And that's really what I think we will see in uh, design of molecules. Please uh, always take my words coming from uh, someone that likes to see transformation. And to do that, you need to bring your optimists. But always at the end of the day, be, bring back a thoughtful level of skepticism, saying, are we there yet? Did we make a good leap? But maybe it's not good enough. And if you have that yin and yang of, of healthy skepticism, but uh, optimism, how fast this is moving, we will continue to uh, cherry pick the areas and the new space where large quantity models is opening up that are more likely near term to be um, fertile ground for completely new type of medicines. We appreciate your pra pragmatism and optimism on the topic, and that's certainly a healthy way to look at it. Um, one of the key advantages of AI is its potential to accelerate the drug development timeline while improving precision at the same time. It can reduce the cost burden in addition to tackling both scale and quality. But what happens, though, is that that could come with a cultural barrier to adoption. And you hinted at this before when you spoke about having an open mindset. How do you see these models, these LQMs, contributing to the way pharmaceutical companies do business today? And what advice would you offer to those in biomedicine looking to engage in shaping this revolution into the next wave of utilizing these large quantitative models? I, I think we need a mix of uh, super experts immersing with super users and culturally curious, willing to transform work processes that becomes a, a culture of the future. Uh, 
I think we need to recognize the large quantity model represent uh, a new dimension that is complementary to the LLMs that have had such a profound effect in so many areas. I think you can reach further with the large quantitative models. I, I think you are able to increase predictiveness uh, by the large quantity models that can incorporate much more and train much more from the ground up uh, mathematical assessment of how different parts of a molecule is interacting with a target. While I think the LLMs are extremely helpful within more of an existing space, when you combine those, yes, you create novelty, but it was all coming from pre-existing pieces of a puzzle that you put together. I think the quantity models are probably more skilled in replacing some of these pieces of the puzzle with a, a different piece that hasn't been part of our toolbox because it's able to calculate a lot of the interaction um, binding entropies, energies and maybe even mobility of, of this type of uh, interactions. In, in a way it moves from 2 to 3 to maybe 4D calculations and that, I think, is bringing it to a new level where you can hope for even more novelty. These represent, for me, parallel approaches and, and possibly performing them allow you also to pick experiences uh, from the two approaches. And in a way, you, you know, maybe it's to use a, a, a simpler language here, maybe the the large quantity model is really the bottom-up procedure, designing from mathematics from bottom-up with a likelihood of creating more novelty. The LLM starts more from the top down and puts things together uh, maybe in a new way. But I, I'm a firm believer that uh, we need to think about those as complementary approaches. That's why we shouldn't have fear that those that have accumulated tremendous experience based on years of uh, drug discovery should be left behind. We're creating a new type of teams where there's room for everyone. The challenge is if you stay on the sideway, if you're not engaging. And unfortunately, I think some are feeling this is just too much. I like the way we have performed things, but it's no different from the first period of genetic revolution, where we clearly had a lot of generation of insights that turned out to not be entirely right, and we had to correct and evolve. This is about evolution. Look, it's really a call to action, a call to join the team from whatever of these communities you've spent your career. And uh, it's only when you kind of feel, I'm so comfortable in where I am, I don't like stepping out of my comfort zone. I think that's a really risky behavior, and that's a culture that is going to hold companies back. Um, and I, I think we need to address that. We need to provide training, education. But I do see even those that are the most world-class chemists, antibody designers, but are skeptical to that AI, whether LLMs or the large quantum models, are ready for prime time, I do see them increasing over the last one to two years saying, well, I'm willing to explore. I'm willing to be um, looking at this. So I, I'm fascinated by the world of de novo creativity by AI, where I think the large quantum models are extremely strong. Operational efficiency and time savings and ability to structure language where the LLMs are tremendously powerful, but I cannot resist turning it back to you. How do you see, uh, you know, the left and the right hand, the two siblings, and more members to come into this family of mathematical algorithms, how do you see them interact? Or do you that spend good time as a professional change agent from the AI side, C1 is not inclusive of the other? I, I see it the way you do. I think the innovation's going to happen at the the convergence of these cross disciplines. If we start to solve problems from, you know, 
a purist sort of physics and chemistry perspective, building it from the ground up, that allows us to explore the chemical space in a very efficient way to discover things de novo. And so we plug in AI where it's relevant and where it's appropriate um, versus combing over a large corpus of data in order to gain insights that are very close to the trading data. So to me, I think, you know, the, the confluence of these disciplines coming together is really where the innovation is going to lie. And it's, it's a thread that we carry through and how we set up our teams and how we solve problems and how we look at problems that no one else has been able to solve at Sandbox AQ. We bring together physics experts, computational chemists, bioinformatics experts, software engineers, everyone working together on this problem. And that's, that is where the magic happens. And so I see it very, very much like you do. My takeaway is when you work with serious people that are uh, use really advanced al algorithms, uh, can describe their training sets. Uh, I mean, that's the difference between high school basketball and Olympic basketball. I just want to say that every time a new field is emerging, Make sure you seek to partner with the best companies, the best talents, and use a team of different experts as advisors, and you will get four. Because mistakes will happen everywhere. It happens by the best in the world, but uh, you know it's different if it happens because we did all the right assessment, we did all the right scrutiny. That's different and versus having taken shortcuts. Thank you, Michael, for this engaging and spirited conversation. I always very much enjoy sitting down with you, and I'm glad we were able to share this very timely conversation with our listeners today. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Nadia, for this dialogue. And I, I think you and your team at Sandbox represent one example of those really serious, uh, well-trained uh, colleagues that can change the outcome of how AI work with biomedicine and we need to see more of those type of teams um, guide us into the future. And I'm an optimist and think that uh, the future will have much more change and impact than we ever can imagine. Maybe it takes a little bit more time, but if we have a sense of urgency, that time window will soon shrink. Absolutely. Thank you again.